into a hardball format here. <laughs> Hope not. Okay, so what we thought we would uh, do with two of the most uh, effective and innovative leaders in America is just begin by asking some questions about how you really started early colleges. What was, what were some of the uh, lessons that you learned from the early days? What were some of the uh, barriers? And for me, what would, what would you have done differently if you launched it today? It's a lot of questions. I don't care where we start. Tony. Well, it's, I guess beginning at the beginning is a great thing to do, Marlene. It was good to see C.C. Cunningham on the screen here because Cece was the inspiration as we were visiting LaGuardia, then Middle College, um, and collecting observations about that time. And um, it, when we sent those observations back to our governor, then Mike Easley, and Mike Easley had made a connection with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They had seeded this work, uh, but the real motivation was economic disruption in this state was leaving too many communities without access to jobs. And the governor and others, the president of the community college system, university system, saw early college as a way to create more of a seamless pipeline for young people. We had a lot to learn, but that's sort of the genesis of it. Let me ask Scott to weigh in because he was the president of Craven Community College, one of the first early colleges in North Carolina. I think he has some on the ground experiences. I was a new president there, and my recollection is uh, and looking back on it, I think this was a good thing. We weren't asked if this was something we should do. As you mentioned, Governor Easley said, we shall do this. And that was probably a good thing because at that point in time, if we had been asked to take a vote, we may have very likely said, uh, we've got too much on our plate. And we also had our, we, we've had a friendly bulldog of a leader in North Carolina ever since in terms of Tony, who has uh, <laughs> never let us slow down uh, and has, uh, you know, he carries a smile and a cattle prod, so he, he'll push you and then he'll smile and push you, and so, and we've needed that to move forward. But, you know, I think North Carolina was a fertile ground for a couple of reasons. Uh, to mention that early college grew out of dual enrollment. We had such extensive dual enrollment in North Carolina. This is the state where tech prep started at Richmond Community College years ago. So the notion of high school students taking college classes in terms of pathways that lead to something was not new to North Carolina. And so I think early colleges became an evolution. And I think also the way it was implemented, and I credit Tony with this, is laying out clear principles, stages of implementation, uh, different groups going at different times, learning from each other. I think looking back on that implementation uh, was really kind of a brilliant strategy that helped that happen and move forward in North Carolina the way it did. If you were advising states, what policies would you say are most important? More to s systemically get this in, embedded in districts and in communities, what, what advice would you have? Well, I think, you know, I, that's a good question. I, I think that for North Carolina, for us, perhaps what would be hurdles in other places were road bumps here. You know, I think, I think back to those days, some of the things we wrestled with as community colleges and as post-secondary was the notion of, you know, we, we had high school students on campus, but then we were having ninth grade high school students on campus. And I remember the, the conversations that were difficult at the time. Uh, there were faculty conversations, oh, that'll never work. There were student government conversations. Well, wait a second, you know, we're, most of our students average age are 28 and we're gonna have ninth graders on campus. You know, but I think, I think what's very important is to remain true to the principles, and I think one of the key principles was the power of the place, mm -hmm. yeah. and I think one of the things that was very important in the implementation of the best early colleges was the notion of integrating early colleges into the college framework, such that the students really believed and were college students, and it wasn't just set off as something in another part of town and had some tangential relationship. And I think that's very important, is to make sure that this is not a tangential part of a college, but it is truly integral to the overall part of the college. And I think that was partly key to our success in North Carolina. Yeah, I, I, I think you're absolutely right, Scott. The only thing I would add to that is there is this 
inclination in, in public education and probably other institutions, everyone feels like they have to invent it on their own. Mm -hmm. And we worked really tirelessly with you and many others around effective designs and uh, uh, sort of metrics associated with those effective designs. What we didn't want to have happen is early college become undermined in North Carolina because people were just failing at various rates. What they did was the exact opposite. Because there's a common language and a common set of tools is the school supported each other in their growth and knowledge, yeah. teachers engaging with other teachers. And the last thing I'll say that as a education professional, the thing that has inspired me the most are teachers in classrooms who have been willing to engage in a transparent process with teachers in other schools to talk about the work. And that has been the springboard for quality, those teachers who've made that leap, and we're really very proud of that. One thing I'd add to, I, I'll have to tell you about my, one of my favorite education days was the day we unconsciously decided to start an early college at Craven. And it started <laughs> in a certain way. We were, we were kicking this around, we heard about it, but the, I think the beauty of the implementation here is the fact that different groups got to learn from other groups, and you see this in this network here in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. The early college network hangs mm -hmm. together and learns from each other, but I remember that day at Craven, I was, we took the school van, I was driving the van, we wheeled by, picked up the superintendent, some of the high school uh, principals. We drove to Edgecombe Community College, which had one of the earliest community colleges mm -hmm. in North Carolina, and since I was dri driving, we stopped at Dee's Barbecue and ate at the tables out there, and I think that <laughs> helped our relationship. But then we got there, and what we saw at Edgecombe Community College that day was students succeeding and having opportunity that they just would not have otherwise. And we spent four hours that day. We heard about the structure, but we mostly heard from the students. And what I recall is that we got back on that van about 6 o'clock that night and never had a formal conversation about whether or not we were going to do it or not. Mm -hmm. It was just decided by all of us that yes, we are going to do this. The only decision we made was whether we would start that first year or wait another year for additional planning, yes. which we did, which I think was a great decision. But just, I think, that ability to learn from each other and to see that you can do this in the context in communities that are similar to you was a great benefit for North Carolina. Let me ask about the Common Core and how the two of you are thinking about both the implementation of it, the alignment across secondary and post-secondary, the relationship between early college building out and uh, uh, defining their, how they're going to be implementing Common Core in relationship to uh, district-wide implementation. Can you just talk a bit about these sets of issues? and? Well, we're a state that's had a standard course of study for a very long time, and so the, com the Common Core in some ways is just another evolution of that. I guess the, the succinct response to your question, Marlene, is this, that what, what is so inspiring about our partner early colleges is there are groups of adults in those schools that are learners. And so when something like the Common Core comes around, they are predisposed to continue their learning and support one another in that learning. And in addition, as you know, the Common Core lends itself toward the application of content to things that really matter. Those teachers have already been doing that work, so it's really evolutionary for them in most cases, not revolutionary. And it, it again, it speaks to the strength of the talent, the principals and teachers and counselors who are working those settings. In, in my experience working with community colleges, I think there's a couple of things that have grown out of our uh, learnings from early colleges that are affecting us in post-secondary and the connection. One is the notion of clear pathways, but then the other, and it was mentioned in the video, about aligned expectations. And I think ultimately that's what Common Core is about. We have, it's about aligned expectations. Now, it seems like we're getting a lot of, caught up in a lot of rigmarole right now about different aspects of Common Core, but ultimately that's what it's about, and that's what early colleges broke down in North Carolina. It was, you know, the notion of moving seamlessly from one place to the other. And so we have seen that, in, and I think it's influenced what we do in North Carolina. It, you know, what we had for many years in North Carolina was a, a placement process in community colleges that was not aligned at all with public schools. So students would test, 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 come out of public schools, we'd give them different tests and put them back, two-thirds back into high school programs, which was just stupid when you think about that. 
So, you know, it's about aligning expectations so we don't waste student time and state resources in that regard. It's, it's the same concept as we have with our cell phones. If we had to all work under different standards all the time, every time we walked into a different building, we'd have to set our, reset our cell phones. We have to have common conversations. We have to pull together and understand and have common alignment. And that's ultimately what this is about. So I think hopefully early colleges has taught us the value of aligned expectations. I will tell you it's impacting now our, our conversations with universities about how we realign expectations around articulation. So um, to me it's, it's a fundamental lesson from early colleges. If I could build off of that, I think in part, you know, the early stage work here was about getting clearer about what's a college going culture and learning from the students what does it take to get students truly ready. And so that's the early stage emphasis that had to happen. I think today it's about, in many ways, rethinking what does career and technical education that's mean right. and blending career and technical education with college readiness, not in ways that limits the options of young people. Yeah, but, but creates that seamless experience that you're talking about. And a moment ago, I talked about the deep connections into business and industry. That's sort of part and parcel of how this is evolving. Let's follow that theme for a minute, because there is a lot of controversy about how actually do you create a, well, do we have a separate career technical education system? How, how do you create a robust educational experience and yet align it with the needs of the future needs of the economy? And States all over this nation are struggling with that uh, issue. Can you speak to how you, both of you are thinking about it and how you're uh, kind of uh, working collaborati collaboratively to move that well, agenda? Let me just sort of start and then toss it to, to Dr. Rawls here. I think that the leadership of the community college system and our State Department of Public Instruction are working really very closely to move an aligned system together. We're a support to that. We're honored to be a support to that. Um, Personally, I think that we're at a point where we have to totally reimagine career and technical education, what that means in the K-12 setting. And there's a great deal of work there to do. There's too much rigidity that comes out of Washington that inhibits flexibility and creativity on the ground. And the seeds of that have been planted in this state, and I can cite many examples where teams of teachers and their administrators are thinking very, very differently about the design of courses and what does work-based experience look like and so forth. So I think there's a great deal of hope and excitement, but we shouldn't underestimate the work to do to reimagine what career and technical education is in the future. I, I always go back to the three R's that we learned from the early college experience, rigor, relevance, relationships, and ultimately the whole career technical piece is about relevance. And I think one of the things in North Carolina, you know, we're we're moving to a new form of endorsements on high school diplomas. Uh, we have career ready, college ready, but I'll tell you what's most intriguing to me and I think should excite us the most is career and college ready. Uh, because when we look at students in high school and we look at parents for high school students, we all aspire for our kids to go as far as they can possibly go. But we also want them to have a context and a relevance to to have affinity for, for mm -hmm. a, a breadth of different opportunities. And I think what we have missed in the United States is uh, that aspect of relevance. I think that's where we need to, and, mm -hmm. and what we really need to aspire to in North Carolina is career and college ready students. That should be our ultimate aspiration and we're going to have to, to rethink a little bit what we've always done to, to get to that place. I mean in some sense when we uh, look at the, this generation of young people, they've lost a lot in terms of work experience. I think they've declined, so like a 42% decline in employment. Well, they don't have how the same would, opportunities right, that we did. Right, they don't have the same opportunities. So how would you bring work into, to be more of a learning laboratory for young people that's at a much higher level than what we uh, experience? They, what, they have new opportunities. They may not yeah. have the same opportunities, but they have new and no. different opportunities. And I think Scott is absolutely right. It's about college and work readiness with the addition of clarity around skills. You know, what are the commitments in terms of skills development for every child? Students have new and different opportunities. In part, it's about technology, but yeah. in part, it's about imagining in different ways how school happens. Just to cite one example, that there's a team here representing the Northeast Regional School of Biotechnology and Agri-Science, and that's a school that's growing on the campus of a rural agricultural research station where there are doctorally prepared scientists uh, connected to a tier one research university and so the work-based experiences for those young people is understanding the, the research that's happening 
in, in growing new types of crops and having direct experience there. I think whether it's healthcare or whatever the industry group is, there are ways of blending the environments that are so unlike what we knew in the last um, century. I, I think because teenagers now do not have the same work opportunities, it's even more important for us to rethink work-based learning and apprenticeship-like opportunities. I think that's what we're in the beginning discussions of in North Carolina. But it's a very difficult thing to do. I mean, that's a very big lift, mm -hmm. and we're going to, we have to realize that experiences in Bertie County are not the same as in Wade County, and we're gonna have to figure out how to uh, create experiences for students yes. that is going to be different as well. And I think that's probably, as much as anything, uh, could be the next big thing for us in North Carolina to think yes. through. I think so, and I could, if I could add, I mean, you have been such an advocate for high quality work-based experiences, and the trick is, how do we not repeat the failed practices of the past? The past. So. Great. Do you, um, we're gonna open it up for questions uh, from the audience, but any last comments on the set of issues as we move into the next few days, talk about? kind of the next evolution of early college designs and where you'd like to see North Carolina go or the nation go? I always felt the secret sauce of early colleges was the one of the R's, the relationship R, because you know what, what allows students to succeed is high expectations and high rigor, but you have to have a high relationship for that to happen. I was thinking about this morning, I was watching my son have a conversation with my wife over a homework assignment which he did not, he was working on and he asked my wife to read it and she read it and said, you know, Lucas, this is fine, but this is not good work. And he responded, yeah, but it's fine. Well, you know, that's what doesn't, <laughs> but you know, that's what early colleges doesn't tolerate and it's because of that relationship piece. It is right. saying that, you know, we have said to kids that you should have high expectations and we're gonna hold you to high rigor, but you know, I think early colleges have proved that adage um, that kids don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. Yeah. And I think that's also, the thing I've struggled with is that's also our Achilles heel a little bit with early colleges because it is tough to scale relationships. It is tough to scale smallness. It is tough, you know, I think that's the challenges that our instructors face. You know, we have these, we have these conversations about whether class size matters and all those different issues. But I think the thing we know from early colleges is that relationships fundamentally do matter. And the challenge we have moving forward is how do we scale the kinds of educator-student relationships broader and move, and, and I think that's our big challenge in, in spreading the early college movement, if you will. Well, you know, I would add to that, we've done, um just to be very blunt about it, a horrible job of respecting and growing teachers. Um, a, uh, <laughs> and and so, so in addition to meaningful relationships premised on performance, I think we need to be really very clear about school and district embedded systems to grow and develop great teachers that are, have many of the components we have uh, road tested in the early college work and getting real smart about that and getting the state leadership to make adequate investments in that. It is very, very clear, no matter where you look around the world, countries that have made significant gains have done that because they've made a commitment to their teachers. There's no shortcut, there's no silver bullet, and people who are out there talking about vouchers and privatization and somehow distorting market competition theories into public education simply are ignorant. I mean, I, I could dress it up, they're just ignorant. Um. I've told you a story about my, one of my favorite education days, which was the day the decision was sort of subconsciously made to start an early college. Another of my favorite days was a day that, um, it was the last day of the first year of the early college at Craven Community College, and it was time for the students to leave. And the buses were picking the students up. They went to the high schools to be distributed from there, and so they were picking up the students and the students um, were heading out and the teachers who had worked their tails off that year, you know, they're just an unbelievable they group of instructor teachers, and they were high-fiving the end of the yeah, year, yeah. and they got down the, they got to the, where they were making the curve and the buses stopped. 
And all of those teachers got off the buses, I mean, all those students, to hug their teachers. Oh, now, that oh, is man. what we should all aspire to. Yeah. That's what early colleges have allowed. That is the value of teachers in student lives. And, and I have seen it more in early colleges than any, and I think that's the yeah. value of relationships. So yeah. how, do we, how do we get beyond just early colleges to allow for those kind of educator-student relationships? That's our, that's our fundamental challenge, I think, in, in education. It, you know, it really is, and I'm, I'm, if there's a video being made here, I'm hoping they're gonna edit this stuff out because um, it, <laughs> it, it shouldn't leave this room. We've allowed, we have allowed the business of growing and supporting great teachers and teaching to be too highly politicized. Right. And so we need our business leaders to own that and make a commitment to our teachers so that it doesn't depend upon who's elected in what office, that we have a societal commitment to right. great right. teaching. There's just no shortcut. Right. Final question. We have a lot of dysfunction in Washington uh, right now, to say the least. What do you think, how much is this driven in your mind in communities and uh, through the commitment of teachers and faculty and leaders? Um, how much or what role would you want Washington to play, if any, in advancing this agenda? Silence. <laughs> well, that takes care of one box. <laughs> I'm already in trouble, Scott, so this is your turn. <laughs> Scott's testifying this week. Yeah, I Scott. Too. I'm testifying on Thursday, so I should <laughs> probably think about this. Um, you know, I think that, you know, I think what we have to be careful of, and I think I have to, I've learned to try to be careful of this at the state level is we need to not put too much, let me back up. Um, <laughs> the great thing I think about the implementation of early colleges in North Carolina is it held to non-negotiable principles but didn't go a lot further than that, mm -hmm. if that's fair. Mm -hmm. We said here's what has to take place, but given that box, you got a lot of room to play with. You got a lot of room to make that happen. And I think that's sort of what we have to keep in mind in Raleigh as best we can and in Washington as best we can to say, you know, there are certain things that should be, you know, and, and I think expecting that we have some commonality and expectations and standards is something that we should say should be. It doesn't make mm -hmm. sense for us to not share common expectations across states and across post-secondary and high school about what standards should be. But if we get beyond that, maybe there's Maybe we put too much on the educational community to say, well, but then you got to do this, 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 and this. And so a lot of times, we, for, in the name of accountability, we will put things on you to do things that doesn't give you the room to do the right things. And that balance is very difficult. Yeah. So, you know, paying attention to the big things, but not sweating all the little things as much, I think, is probably fundamental to, to what we should be paying attention to, and I have to tell myself that constantly in my role um, here in Raleigh. <laughs> yeah, I, I, the only thing I would add to that, I, I think that Marlene's question is really very um, important. We are a divided country. Um, we are a divided state in many ways. Our political opinions have hardened, um, and what we have tried to do uh, to make it a real commitment is to take legislators into schools, to talk with teams of teachers, to talk with teams of students so that when they are having these conversations, difficult conversations about policy and funding, they, they can think about what do they hear from those teachers. And I, I can tell you on many, many occasions, those visits have had a direct impact for what happens in the North Carolina General Assembly. Right. And the final question, and so this might be a little touchy, but any good marriage goes through its ups and downs, takes a lot to navigate, negotiate, and you guys have been in partnership for a long time. Do you want to share with us any of the difficulties, the little bumps that might have happened that you got through to really lead to this kind of extremely successful national uh, movement? You don't bring the any flowers men, so anymore. <laughs> 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 Makes me think of that old song. 
Well, I mean, at the state <laughs> level, I mean, there are times when Tony hits me with a cattle prod that smiles at me. So, I mean, that's the, we, 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 we all have to be pushed a little further than we're willing to go. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. what early colleges have been able to do. And Tony has been a master in pushing all of us to go further than we probably otherwise would, which is a sign of great leadership. I, I think the thing that's also, what I saw at the early college where we were, is it takes, I, I used to say to folks who are considering this, unless you have that great partnership, mm -hmm. don't do it. Because it takes both the secondary and the post-secondary. I know we've received a lot of credit in community colleges for doing this, but I'll tell you, when I, was, when I watched, the biggest sacrifice was by the school superintendent. Mm -hmm. And he was the great leader in r putting the resources there. And there were things that we found that we had to make greater sacrifices for that we never thought of. You know, the issues of space became a much bigger issue for us at community colleges than we anticipated. But at some point, we all got a above that hump where we may complain about things, but we would never go back to where we were before. I remember having that deliberate conversation with community college presidents five, six years ago, and we were complaining about some, oh gosh, just, you know, we've got all these space issues, got all these students, mm -hmm. the early college has taken up a lot of space, and I remember asking and saying, would any of us change and go back knowing what we know today, and nobody raised their hands. So, Early colleges are embedded, I believe, in the public school fabric, the community college fabric, and have brought together the two in a culture that is very advantageous for our state. So, you know, I, yeah, we've had the, we've had issues, but the fact that we've had to work together to overcome those issues, I think it makes us better prepared to deal with the issues we currently face now. Yeah, it's, it's a reframing entirely. And you know, right. you're, you're being too generous, Scott, and I appreciate that. I think the difference is you are an institutional leader and we are not. Um, we have to serve and support the institutional leaders in the K-12 system, the university system, and the community college system. So we've got to continually focus on the relationship, Marlene, and how do we communicate and, and problem solve and so forth and try to push the envelope. But our, our role is to be that support system. We, we are not the, the uh, body that's making those final decisions. Great, well I'm gonna turn to the audience and uh, see if they have any questions for uh, Scott or Tony or myself. We have mics, mics. Uh, good morning, John Fitzpatrick with Educate Texas. Thank you so much for hosting us. Um, my question is about sort of the evolution of the last 10 years when we started out with the original, you know, 100 students in a grade, 400 students in a school, to where we are today. And if you look at the different um, presentations and, and, and breakout groups, you've got online, you've got comprehensive high schools, you've got the traditional model, you've got CTE, and it would just be great to hear both in North Carolina and nationally how you're thinking about this balance of the traditional 400 student sort of standalone early college high school and this whole um, sort of new strategic opportunity with these, with these different type of, of models and how much you're focusing on supporting the existing traditional model versus either R&D or scaling of, of new ways of offering you know, what we all love about early college. Um, John, that's a, a wonderful question. I know Educate Texas is, is uh, addressing many of the components of the question as we are. I, I think that, um, as I've already said a few moments ago, that we see the core of this business about growing and supporting great teachers and teaching and doing that in teams, away from the old model where people are working independently a along a hallway. And the application of those school embedded and district embedded uh, solutions are, are relevant for the entire continuum in the K-12 uh, environment. I think at the uh, end of the day going forward, what's going to happen, again, because of the, the economy and changes in technology, is every community is gonna gravitate toward a portfolio of options that may be unique to their circumstance. As you heard Scott say a moment ago, a rural place like Bertie versus Wake County is gonna have a different set of solutions. So being nimble, and being nimble, uh, but knowing that the core supports have to do with great teaching and great leaders that can get behind that teaching and consistently support it uh, during the transition in staff. Yeah, John, it's a great question. I, from JFF's perspective, as we 
think about scaling this district-wide. The, as Tony's saying, you need to be nimble and we need to be more adaptable in the, in the models and it, it will look uh, very differently. So the I3 work that we're doing with PSJA and you all and uh, Brownsville and Denver, we're really testing a different model about whether or not uh, you can get the same results and have the same experience and remodel the school so that it's a district approach. So you may say the minimum of gatekeeper courses and 15 or 20 credits or a way of thinking about work-based learning as a strategy to enhance uh, competencies. It's, it really is testing uh, the adaptability of a model to the district-wide strategy, and we're gonna have to think about it from you know, nine through 13, nine through 14 pathways, different ways of organizing pathways back on track, uh, as well as those within the, ho the college uh, and high school experience. So we're testing, we don't know yet, in all honesty. We are testing this and to see whether or not in a very efficient way we can bring early college, again, teaching, learning, all the pedagogical approaches into a district-wide approach at an efficient, you know, cost. And uh, I think so far, you know, just that on a wink, it's looking good, looking very good. Um, but we're trying to move a little bit, I think you're quite around the standalone uh, early college model. We're getting a cue. Any other uh, questions? Good morning. I'm Ingrid Hall from Balasta, Georgia, Balasta Early College Academy. We've been uh, in business six years. Uh, I'm very excited, first of all, to be here and to know, you know, know of the work and be involved with the work. I'm very pleased to hear about the teaching and learning because on the ground with the teachers and the staff, you're talking about very uh, passionate people, very innovative people, and those people do need, like you said, that support and that learning. So I'm curious to hear in North Carolina with your success, how have you done that with your different schools? How do you collaborate to get that learning to those people on the ground, to keep them excited, passionate, and to help them develop that um, innovativeness that we need to continue to prosper as a school and ask this concept? Um, so thanks for the question, and I look forward to talking with you later. There's a session at the conference to just that point, but I would say it's evolving because our relationships are evolving with our partners in schools and districts. And the, if I were today to point to one thing that motivates our team most, it's this notion of peer observation and review. Uh, more and more, we started bringing folks into North Carolina from all over the country, the best teachers that we could find. And increasingly we find those best teachers are here and giving uh, structure and support to teachers who can share with one another um, as a part of their professional practice in the same way that we would look to physicians to in their profession. Um, so the supports and the structures around that peer observation and review and the creation of a peer learning community, those things are really, really critical. And so we look forward to further conversation. Any other questions? So one over there. Oh, I'm sorry. We have time for one more? One more. Hi, uh, Josh Coffin from Chicago Public Schools. I'm curious, you've talked a little bit about um, setting clear principles and also setting some, uh, a few common metrics that are, you know, go across all of the North Carolina schools. Can you just talk a little bit more about what you put in place as sort of like a baseline for all of the uh, early college schools that you're working with in North Carolina? Do you want to talk about that? Well, you can talk about the, the metric that we use. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so there are a set of design principles that are foundational to uh, the work and uh, those design principles have um, tools attached to them that are used in this uh, peer observation and review process um, so that we can help teams with schools uh, bring evidence and anchor those components in rubrics and, and other tools into the day-to-day -day practice of working with their students and into the design of that school. Increasingly what we've sought to do is to create tools that um, support learning of the adults and bringing some um, substantiality, I guess, to, to the conversations they have 
uh, when they talk about the progress of their school or when they look at another school and talk about the progress of that school. Um, um, there's some work being done at the conference around those components that I think you might be interested in. The, you know, one of the things that I'd like to say about that is that one of the great reliefs in my life around this has been that the data substantiated the personal experience. Mm -hmm. We, all of those of us who in this room who have been involved in early colleges, in our hearts knew that it worked not because of the data but because we saw student experiences that we believed would not have happened had it not been that environment. But it would have been tragic for all of us if we had looked at the data and mm -hmm. said that was not the case. And fortunately, the data shows that that is the case and even more. So mm -hmm. in North Carolina, I don't think we ever expected that 50% of the early college students approximately would complete associate's degrees and high school degrees simultaneously. I don't think we ever could have expected that, but that is phenomenal. I mean, that is, a, and when you look at just, when, when you look at the data, when they did comparisons about students who, you know, suspension data, and other, it was just mm -hmm. phenomenal. And so I think for all of us who had the personal experience of early colleges and then can look at the metrics, the fact that the metrics substantiate what we see. And I, and I think here's the next evolution for what we see and the impact of early colleges. So we can look and see that students uh, you know, a couple of years ago, I was at Tri-County Community College in Murphy. One of their first groups, they had 23 students out of Murphy, as far back in the mountains as you can get in North Carolina, and 18 that year were graduating and going on to four-year colleges. The next evolution of metrics, which I don't know how we'll capture, it should be maybe a documentary or something, is what I would refer to as the return of the early college students. I mean, you think of the Raymonds of the world. Okay, so when Raymond goes forward, he gets that degree, he gets out, he, when these students start going back to their communities and impacting North Carolina, mm -hmm. somehow we've got to capture that metric, the return of the early college students and the impact they have on their communities from the impact that the early colleges have had on them. Well said. Excellent. Hi, my name is Michelle. I'm with the Alamo Colleges in San Antonio, Texas. Um, as the model moves from the whole school to the whole district, I'm wondering what, what is the role of the four-year institution? I read somewhere, I think it was in a JFF publication that 72% of the post-secondary partners are two-year partners. So how can we in the state of Texas engage our four-year institutions more operationally into in carrying out the model? That's a great uh, mm -hmm. question. I think right now we're about a 60-40 split between four-year and two-year with 60% uh, being two-year, 40% four-year. Um, you know, one way to think about this, and JFF needs to think about it, is trying to bring together the four-year institutions who are actually involved in this work and committed to it and talking a lot more to their peers. I think cracking the post of the four-year university mentality around this work is probably one of the most difficult mm -hmm. chores we have. And the way that I think happens best is by peer-to-peer -peer conversations. And I think leaders like at ASU and other places across the nation, the uh, public four-year universities, have a lot to say about this and that we should try to galvanize the support of those that are now involved to speak to their uh, Peers. It was a great, uh, a great question, and I'll certainly give a lot more thought because the there is a you know a problem with people thinking that this is you know at its at its worst are we tracking people into the two year uh, degree programs and really in my mind all we're doing is opening up opportunity into the four year uh, university and into very very uh, robust careers for these uh, young people. So I think it's a right question. I'd love. I think it's very important, let's don't get caught in the concept that because we're talking about two years that students are, st are stopping Stop at two years. Mm -hmm. right. And that's why what's most important, I believe, in this conversation is thinking about articulation. You know, because what it is, it's about articulation from public school mm -hmm. to community college to universities. Right. By definition, all the, almost all of the early college graduates in North Carolina are going to universities. So. Community colleges, we have to understand, and sometimes it's difficult for us, 
we're not necessarily destinations, we're pathways. We're either pathways to four-year institutions or pathways to jobs. And so what I would encourage is don't get caught up in the notion of, okay, we community college or university. Community college is the pathway to universities, just like early colleges is part of that pathway. So I think this issue about statewide articulation is what's fundamentally important from a policy standpoint. And I think as we think about very broadly uh, economic clusters, like you look at what Illinois is doing or Tennessee or other states, that at, uh, it's really timely to get the four-year institutions involved in that discussion and the alignment of these pathways straight through high school, college, two-year, right. four-year careers. And right now, I don't think they're very engaged, but they're getting more engaged. Well, I, I think that's it. Worthy of its own conversation, and the uh, Tier One universities in this state are now all engaged in early college strategies. But it's not just about collaborating on a school; it's about thinking really strategically about how does that school align with economic innovation and 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 growth. So UNC Charlotte, for example, is in a planning year focused on energy and sustainability, and that planning process um, includes not just their College of Education, but the College of Engineering and other interests across that uh, campus. Here in Raleigh, uh, North Carolina State University, we're in our now emerging into our third year of a school there focused around innovation and what are called the grand challenges of engineering. And there really is a rich conversation around the unique role of those types of universities in scaling change, as well as our historically black colleges and universities mm -hmm. and the unique and important role they play. Great. Well, thank you both for your uh, leadership and for your insights. It was terrific. Thank you. Get rid of us. <laughs>